Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the first session in our 2022 20, series on entrepreneurship in Asian high tech industries. So I want to welcome everybody. I'm Richard Dasher. I direct the US Asia Technology Management Center at Stanford. We are the organization that produces this seminar series. We're an industry affiliates program, which means that our main source of funding is annual membership fees from companies. We are not really on the core Stanford budget, except of course we depend a lot for infrastructure and, and but um, you know, we want to thank our, our 18 member companies for the support to our center, which allows us to produce this series. So what we're trying to do, as we've done every year for about 20 years now, is to share the newest information on, uh, and also trends about entrepreneurship and the supporting ecosystems for entrepreneurship in Asian high tech industries. Um, this is hybrid format. It is open to the public by Zoom. And for the Stanford community, it's, uh, you know, you're welcome to come here in person. Now, if we run out of chairs, I mean, it looks like we're doing fine, but if we were to run out of chairs, I'd want to ask registered students to take precedence and other people to kind of step out by Zoom. The other thing is, if you're a Stanford student, um, the course requirements are on the syllabus. We did have a few hard copies, but the syllabus is posted on Canvas. It's also on our center's website. Um, yeah, yeah, before I go on to the credit requirements, I want to say that we found it's a really mutually good thing to have a mixed audience of people from industry and students in these sessions. In the pre-pandemic days, everybody could stand around and have refreshments afterward. But what really is valuable is just different people with different backgrounds have different kinds of questions that you ask. And increasing the diversity of people we have in the audience really gives uh, us a chance to learn from each other better. So for credit in the course, you got to register. It's available in three different departments. Uh, there's no prerequisites. If you've taken, if you're watching this on Zoom and you've taken the course in the past, you are welcome to take it again because the content is different every year. Um, do check the syllabus. That's the official document about what we require for credit. First thing is regular attendance at the classroom. And um, yeah, this is not a Zoom only seminar. So if you need an accommodation, feel free to send me an email. If it's for a session or two because you've tested positive or something, that's fine. If it's because you've got a conflict with another class, you can send me a note and I would accept that as a reason for an accommodation where you would watch these by video and fulfill the second requirement, which is to send an email comment to me each week with something about the content of that session that you just watched. Uh, the comments are due within two weeks of the session. Please, no attachments keep them in the body of the email, 60 to 90 words, whatever you're comfortable with is fine. Just something that shows you watch the session. And I try to reply to as many of these as I can. Um, yeah, so for the comments and requests or whatever, email me and also CC Brianna, who is going to be helping me keep the attendance for the course. So today, I want to start off with the context of understanding entrepreneurship this year in Asia, especially uncertainty and the questioning of patterns that have really characterized business up until the present time. The second major section will be looking at some statistics on entrepreneurial activity and attitudes in major Asian economies. Then we'll look at the ecosystems, specifically people flow and knowledge flow, and especially money flow. 
uh, that characterize the ecosystem to support entrepreneurship. And hopefully we'll have a little time for discussion. So yeah, we live in a very uncertain world and it's gotten a lot more uncertain recently, right? With the invasion of Ukraine, increasing US-China friction has been something that's been very noticeable at least for the last five years, but it really goes back about 10 years. There's the slow recovery and kind of uneven recovery from COVID-19 that none of these are business things, right? But they make business much more difficult. Climate change is something that increases uncertainty because you're not sure how to uh, price it. You're not sure how regulations may change and affect your business. So that is a, a second major factor that increases uncertainty. The third thing is public attitudes reactions against the success of the giant IT companies. Anti-globalist sentiment is something that's really putting a shock into the uh, world as it is now. And a lot of the radical changes that we're dealing with really have dynamics that are based in the industrial revolution we're living in right now. Really, we're in two revolutions. The third revolution that most people are, uh, by the way, that is usually numbered World Economic Forum or whoever, is really about the spread of digital technology. And the fourth revolution is really the use of new tools for getting value from digital data. These can be things like artificial intelligence or edge computing or uh, even things like quantum computing that's on the horizon. So we're in the middle of that and the world is very uncertain. So what's happened? I'm seeing all sorts of articles questioning whether globalization is going to end or not. This is not just about Ukraine, despite what the um, two headlines that I show on the slides say. It really goes back to the tendencies toward decoupling between the US and China. It goes back to the disruption in the supply chains, especially international supply chains that were caused by COVID shutdowns. And it amounts to popular law worry about loss of jobs, which is a very local thing. The universal benefits that the world has obtained through ease of transportation, ease of travel, low cost, low inflation rates, that applies to everybody. And so nobody notices. So globalization is suddenly being questioned like it hasn't been for a long time. The second common thread in this uncertainty is that the world is really becoming more and more polarized. Who's in the middle? The middle class, right? So. If you feel more proletarian than you did five years ago, you probably are because your income levels are not keeping up with the price of housing in the Bay Area. Um, this is a good chart because it shows between country disparity in income. So the income disparity between countries kept getting worse and worse as the advanced economies in the United States and Europe took off and left the rest of the world until about 1980. Then with the advent of more advanced economies in Asia, these Asia economies left the bottom 50 and moved up into the middle and the top 10% of income countries was not quite as severe as it has been. But what people are noticing is this on an individual level, this horrible bathtub graph, where up until the 1920s, you had quite a bit of income disparity. All the wealthy people back east that built incredible houses around um, Rhode Island and places like this, the Hamptons in New York. And then that really dropped after World War II the growth that the world had for the last 40 or 50 years was uh, relatively not so much income disparity within country, but then 
thanks to stock options and the incredible growth of IT businesses, you've seen more income disparity within a country, right? This is especially bad in the US. The Gini coefficient in the US has gotten a lot worse, uh, but also in, company, in countries like China and in other countries as well. So that makes the world look blue. The third common thread is that this uh, inequality and polarization is really the natural outcome of um, an industrial revolution. The changes we've seen in our lifetimes, even you who are a lot younger than I am, are incredible. We've seen incredible opportunities. We've seen incredibly high risks. The companies and the individuals who tend to innovate, to be on the side of innovation, they tend to win. This means massive wealth creation for a few people, but in the short term, innovation also carries high risk, so there's a lot of company failure too. Uh, so there are losers among the innovators. But if you don't innovate, you're almost certainly going to lose. So you see a small group of people just doing incredibly well and lots of people, no matter whether they try to innovate or whether they are resisting innovation, not doing well. Um, so yeah, since 1980, the growth rates of the Asian economies have exceeded the world growth rate. And this rise of the wealthy class inside each economy has been very noticeable. The third thread, and this is a result of this kind of polarization. You've got rising authoritarianism that's often based on populism or nationalism. This is a very interesting chart from the um, Freedom House, which is uh, how many countries have improved their freedom index versus how many company, countries have gotten worse on their freedom index. And for the last 16 years, the number of countries that have gotten worse has exceeded the number of countries that's gotten better. The freer countries seem to be becoming less free. Read, you know, read the newspaper here. Uh, the countries with tight central control are becoming even more controlled. So the government of China shuts down the after school education industry because public education should be what people want. Uh, this, this kind of thing is uh, dangerous. Ultimately, the first set of industrial revolutions from 1880 until 1920 or so led to two world wars and to the Great Depression. We really don't want that to happen again. Uh, so this is something that personally I care about a lot. I think if you look at what it's doing to entrepreneurship, though, you're going to see a remarkable story. Uh, we'll get there in just a second. What I wanted to point out is, before we get there, the last point about the context is that Asia is continuing to drive world economic growth. So the world growth rate had an incredible bounce out of the COVID recession, right? And uh, it's gradually going to taper off. The US is not going to do badly, but that's lower than the world growth rate. The EU is lower than the world growth rate. Look how much ahead China is look incredibly how much ahead India is, faster than the world growth rate. Uh, you do have Japan, which is looking a lot like Western Europe, a uh, country like Germany. Uh, but overall, the, uh, the countries in um, the Asia are doing quite well. So also, I want to point out something that surprisingly, a lot of people aren't aware of. So in terms of GDP at purchasing power parity, the cost of a typical basket of goods that people have to buy, uh, China is the world's biggest economy. In terms of nominal gross domestic product, the US is still the biggest economy. But uh, after the US, India is number three, and then Japan is number four. 
So these are the gorillas of the world economy. Um, that's the context. What's this happening? What's this doing to entrepreneurship? So I want to introduce the statistics a little bit. There is this very large survey that is conducted every year called the Global Entrepreneurship Monitor. And uh, they actually conduct two yearly surveys of more than 54 economies around the world. Um, the one we're going to pay attention to is the adult population survey. They will not report data from a country if the country team cannot get 2,000 legitimate answers to their survey. So often there's a lot more people uh, in each survey. These are conducted by national teams. The China survey is done by Tsinghua University. The Japan survey is done jointly by four universities in Tokyo. Um, the lead partners, Babson College and three of their worldwide partners are basically ensuring compliance with their standards. We're not gonna use the national expert survey. It's a little too impressionistic for my taste. Um, this has been done yearly since 1999 and the most recent one just came out uh, this quarter. So uh, they also, a lot of what I use is going to be from the online database of the Gem Consortium of Country-Specific Data. Anyway, they have an interesting definition. It's hard to define an entrepreneur. You know, is an entrepreneur a mindset? Is it a skill set? Is it somebody who's actively starting a company or is it somebody who could start a company? Uh, what they do, they avoid all of this by saying that they're going to look at total early stage entrepreneurial activity, which they give the acronym, the T-rate, I love it. Uh, so this includes people who have started a business, but they're not yet paying a salary. And it also includes people who have started a business and have paid a salary for less than three and a half years. The reason they do this is they don't want to get into an argument between what's a startup versus what's a small and medium-sized company, right? You've got traditional restaurants, you've got traditional you know, bookstores or whatever that are not Silicon Valley style startups. This would catch either one of those types of new activities, but only for the first three and a half years of paying the salary. So just remember that's what they're looking at. So the big three Asia economies plus the US. First, let's try to find the US. The US started off around 9% back in 2007 uh, and gradually has increased to 15.4%. That means that 15.4% of the working age population fits into this definition of total early stage entrepreneurial activity. That's a lot of people. Um, now, on the least entrepreneurial of the set, you've got Japan, which kind of sort of looks like it's risen from 4.3% to 5.4%. Uh, Japan didn't give them enough data for 2020, so we only have them up to pre-pandemic. But basically, this is low, it's very stable. This indicates an economy that is not undergoing great change. Uh, in contrast, China's all over the place, right? In 2011, something must have happened in China. We'll see this noticeably a few other times in, in today. Uh, and yet, since 2012, what happened in 2012 in China? Xi Jinping became the uh, head, right? You've had a gradual reduction from 12.8% down to 8.7% in the T in the T rate in China. Um, India has kind of tracked the US sort of, except the last year they had a real bottom out. Now this was 2020, right? This is COVID. 
I'm guessing that the reduction you see in just about everywhere was really um, directly caused by shutdowns. You know, you can't start something if you can't bring people in. You can start something online, but not all the businesses that may not be enough businesses really to keep the rate from dropping. So that's what the big four look like. The Tigers all have lower entrepreneurship rates than the United States does. So this is the same chart for the US, right? Except now it's up at the top of this chart. Um, and what do you see? You're seeing countries where there's still a lot of prestige for working in large corporations. You're seeing countries that had, or economies that had a really active big business base, active financial industry base. So um, it is kind of interesting to see some patterns in here. The country that has really uh, sort of just stayed low and stable is Taiwan, where, you know, they've really ended up right about the same place uh, mainland is now, 8.4%, which is kind of interesting. Uh, South Korea has kind of been all over the place, right? There's been a lot of things going on in South Korea, some of which is not economic, some of which is political. Um, the Southeast Asia countries, as you might expect, are incredible in terms of showing a lot of variation from year to year. 25.5% entrepreneurship rate, right? T rate. And I think that's, is that Indonesia or Vietnam? I have trouble with colors. Uh, in any case, from 25% dropping down to, you know, just an amazing kind of, you know, scale. What's going on? This is called later stage developing economy. It will be very different from one year to the next. There will be people looking for new opportunities. There will be people forced out and trying to uh, start something because they don't have something on their own. The one country that's kind of bizarre in all this is Malaysia. I was very shocked to see that Malaysia, which looked really stable all the time until 2016, suddenly jumped up to 23 or 21.6% key rate uh, in 2017. Unfortunately, we don't have any data since 2017. Um, definitely a uh, situation that would be good to correct, but you can't go back and correct the years or miss them now. Anyway, that's the T rates themselves. If you look at the T rate by gender, actually the T rate, um, among men and women is not too different in the United States. It's quite different in India. More, more men are starting companies. It's extremely different in Korea. More men are starting companies. In PRC, it's not so different. In Taiwan, it's pretty different. And in Japan, it's really different. So yeah, you're seeing um, what level, you know, where diversity has to come from, right? Uh, this is pre-pandemic. And so I'm really looking forward to see what happens to this once we can get some 2021 data. Um, especially, I would hope to see the women entrepreneurship rate rise in uh, a lot of these countries. By age groups, you're seeing some interesting differences. The US is young. Right? I mean, look at the US. 22% uh, of the people were between uh, 25 and 34 years old, and 22% were between 35 and 44 years old. India is very young. Look at the blue line, the middle aged kind of 35 to 44 year olds. It's highest in South Korea and in Japan. It's quite high in some of the other countries as well. It's fascinating to me that in Korea, there's a lot of people who must be getting ready to retire 
and they either have to leave their company or they decide they can find a better way and so they're going to start something. So uh, this is kind of an interesting set, but in general, in the North Asian countries, entrepreneurs tend to be a little bit older than they are in the United States, whereas in especially emerging Southeast Asia, it's very young. In India, it's very young. Okay, so um, one other thing, last thing about entrepreneurs is why did you become an entrepreneur? So they force the choice on their survey that they give out, which is an interview-based survey, as to whether the person is motivated by opportunity meaning they are, they're going to improve their situation, but they didn't really have to become an entrepreneur, versus necessity. There's no other job around, so I have to be an entrepreneur. Uh, in 2018, almost seven times as many people who are entrepreneurs in the U.S. became entrepreneurs because of desire for opportunity than out of necessity. Look how... Uh, Different it is in some other countries, though. Most of Asia is showing considerable lower, lower ratios, which means that um, really in these countries, a lot of people are becoming entrepreneurs because they don't really have a lot of choice. Uh, especially, it's interesting that in China, it actually showed up as being uh, more people becoming entrepreneurs of necessity than um, out of uh, a sense of opportunity. Same thing in India. So um, these are the results of their survey. The gym surveys do another thing that I think is really fascinating. They ask people who are not entrepreneurs to tell why they are not being an entrepreneur. So the first thing that they do that's easy to say is, do you have the intention to become an entrepreneur? Here's the US T rate, the light gray line that we have been looking at. This only goes to 2019. But the number of, the percentage of people who planned to start a company within the next three years um, is a little bit higher, but not much higher. So this is actually a pretty stable situation. The way they ask this question about entrepreneurial intentions is do you plan to uh, start a company within the next three years? Then the other things they ask is, is the reason you're not starting a company because you're afraid of failure or is it because you don't think you have the capabilities to be an entrepreneur? Actually, it's asked in a positive way. And we're incredibly confident in the United States, right? So 65% of people that they surveyed, of these 2,000 people that they surveyed, who are not entrepreneurs, believe that they have the ability to be entrepreneurs. We're very um, you know, self-confident and always have been. The change has been in the perceived entre opportunities for entrepreneurs. Back in the early 2000s, and remember, this is the era when Google was getting big, 30% of the people saw good opportunities for entrepreneurs, but that has increased in 2019 to 67%. This is the real change in this graph. Now, um, this is um, the way the United States looked. Two economies to take a look at. First, China. Something was happening in the year 2011. It was called, uh, what was it? Mass entrepreneurship. There was a government policy that promoted entrepreneurship. And there was a direct relationship between people who said they saw a lot of uh, possibilities to be an entrepreneur, good opportunities, and they saw that they had you know, the skills to be an entrepreneur. And um, so everything, including the intentions to start a company really spiked up. Um, that spike didn't last, right? <laughs> it went back down until 2019. And unfortunately, this is the last year that we have uh, data on 
But 75% of the people who are not acting as entrepreneurs said that they saw good opportunities for entrepreneurs right around them. 67% um, of the people said that they are, now I want to make sure I've got this right. I really do have trouble with colors. 67% is the uh, capability, right? That's green, not red. Yeah. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, so they believe they have the capabilities. The fear of failure is 44.7%. I'm not going to be an entrepreneur because I'm afraid of what will happen if I fail. That's higher than in the U.S., right? In the U.S., it was 35%, but it's not that high. It's especially not that high if you look at a very a country that has a reputation for not being entrepreneurial at all. Japan. Japan actually had a lower fear of failure rate than China did in 2019. That's sort of a bizarre thing, right? But the real difference is this blue line, perceived opportunities. The, the people they surveyed in Japan, only 10% of them in 2019 saw good opportunities around them for uh, starting a company. So that's, um, I think, very sad, but it really tells you a lot about how people perceive the situation in their own country. So a um, couple of things about understanding this session section. Yeah, the difference between a startup versus a traditional SME is not dealt with in this survey. So startups, the, especially the Silicon Valley model for startups are all about increasing the value, meaning the valuation of the company as much as possible, as quickly as possible, and then exiting so that you make a lot of money. And then if you want to, you start another company or you change your career to be an investor or you just you know, go off into space with Jeff Bezos or something. Anyway, uh, the startups model, the Silicon Valley model is very segmented. You're going to give seven to 10 years of your life to a company if you start it, but you probably will not be giving it to your children in the same way that you did. In contrast, a traditional SME and a lot of medium sized companies like parts companies in the auto business and so forth. They tend to stay small. Their natural kind of growth potential is not so great. But, you know, if you start a restaurant, you can become big, but usually only by franchising and expanding beyond one location. Uh, same thing about retail, professional services. Um, this is why you don't usually get a lot of investment from venture capitalists in areas like this, right? Now, there are some intermediate types, especially you see these in European companies, and they will aim for organic growth. Um, any path, if you feel like it's a path to success, is legitimate. One is not necessarily better than the other. Uh, what is important is to define your own personal goals. You know, are you going to bring great value to the world or you just want to make money. Um, and the other part is you must be able to communicate with your business partners, including the investors, all the people who work with you and everything to understand the dynamics inside that startup company. I'm saying this because you're going to see some differences in growth patterns. It's not so much company formation as much as it is company growth that differs widely between Asia and the US, or at least some countries in Asia and the US. So the classic, uh, the classic model is a company founded in 2009, Square. So Square grew about 100% a year for more than 10 years. That's a lot. After about year three and four, they kept the growth going. Um, in this model, what happens is 
you've got to get money from somewhere to start up the capital in the company. Uh, that's usually going to come first from angel investors, individual investors, not venture capital companies. Uh, but the second funding, when you're actually, you've got something going and you're showing that there's a little bit of market interest in what you have, you've got a prototype you can actually sell or something you put out on Kickstarter or whatever, that's when the VCs come in. And they may eventually take a third to a half of your company. By the time you exit the company, after going through round after round of investment, in the Silicon Valley model, founders typically have between 10 and 25% of the company. That's what you can negotiate. Zuckerberg had 25% of Facebook. Um, there's also all these clever ways that people have. I mean, this, this system has been gained so beautifully where you create two different classes of stock. So you sell off all the non-voting stock to people. You give all lots of stock options that have no voting privileges, but you keep all the voting stock, right? So this kind of thing is great for companies that are gonna grow 100% a year. That's really kind of the expectation among the professional investors here. And from the earliest day, you talk to somebody who hasn't yet even been to an angel investor, they will talk about exit possibilities. They will talk about who might buy the company. They will talk about, um, yeah, because 90% of successful exits in the U.S. are by acquisition. Um, yeah, this needs to be updated a little bit, more than 50 or 60 IPOs, it's more like 190 IPOs in 2021. But 2021, as we'll see, is rather different. Um, yeah, here's the Square. This was the example. So Square was started in 2009. They got money really on about every 12 or 13 months. Look how the amount of money they get just keeps getting more and more and more. Probably the difference between this classic model and what you would see now is you would see SoftBank or somebody coming in around this point, and they would still not be IPO for another couple of years, right? SoftBank Vision Fund would make a billion dollar investment in the company. And then instead of just going IPO, maybe they would even do this thing where you have a SPAC, a special purpose acquisition company that you merge with, and then that goes IPO. Um, but the thing to look here look how much their business increased within the space of three years from processing a billion dollars of credit card payments where they probably kept about 1% as their, uh, their cut after they paid off the, the credit card companies and everything else to $30 billion, 30X growth within three years. And they declared about $900 million of real revenue. So this is what, everybody aspires to here, here. Not necessarily that way in Asia. So to understand this part of it, I wanna go into the ecosystems to support entrepreneurship and talk a little bit about the dynamics of how this moves around. Are there any questions up to this point? Does anybody wanna stop right now? Go ahead. Uh, I have Question. So, um, do it include, for example, um, a startup that like acts as by a private equity firm, like a bank, then, or just like? So, that is a kind of acquisition. Awesome. Uh, a lot depends on that. When they when they do the statistics, they will talk about strategic acquisition, which doesn't usually include private equity firms. That will be called a buyout. Yeah. Because basically they're looking at the assets this company has and saying we can split it up and sell them off and make more money than we can get, you know, just by, then we have to pay for buying the stock. So, yeah, it doesn't really, yeah, <laughs> but that, that's an acquisition and it fits into that 90% figure, but at least 70 to 80% of those will be strategic acquisitions by a company that sees the startup company as being somehow something it has to have, own, critical in its path. Uh, and there are various reasons. One is keep them off the market, don't let them become a competitor. 
One is you want this technology to reposition your company. So once in a while, Google makes a huge acquisition. Like when they bought Fitbit uh, a few years before that, they bought Nest. They're immediately getting into a new business line, right? It's You might as well pay for it instead of doing it in-house and having to devote your engineers to it for three years. So yeah, that's, that's the majority of acquisition. Great question. Go ahead. I'm curious on the T data from the Southeast Asian countries, what uh, do you think that there could be some like survey irregularities that cause the variance in that? Because 2000, 2000 surveys to represent an entire country population. Yep, I do. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> now, I, I, that calls into question, you know, how really good they do this survey. Having to have a sample of at least 2,000 people should keep that down. And the surveys are done by really good, you know, groups of people. You can't argue with Tsinghua in, in China, right? Uh, and so that blip in 2011 in China and the sudden drastic run-up in 2018, between 2018 and 19 in China, that can't be Tsinghua's fault. I mean, I, I don't know, that's, I don't have, I haven't independently put together 2,000 people to verify it, but I have my suspicions. And um, anybody who's ever done field work knows how easy it is to skew a survey. Even just the tone of voice you use in asking the question, right? So um, yeah, that's a possibility. <laughs> Go ahead. The T metric. Um, so it certainly does seem like it covers like the big that you want to. So tech startups or the small uh, medium sized businesses. Do you think it also captures um, entities that maybe you don't want to consider, like maybe shell companies and things like that that aren't as good indicators of entrepreneurship? Or do you say that it's pretty impactful in that regard? I think it's good for what it does. I like it because it doesn't involve much subjective assessment of what is a startup, okay? But granted, that's not exactly what we're thinking about when we're thinking about the Silicon Valley model of entrepreneur, right? So um, yeah, you can create shell companies. You know, it's one of the popular things now is to create a holding company for your IP. And then your operating company will not own the IP, but you'll have an exclusive license with them. That way, if your operating company goes bankrupt, you still own the IP. You know, you don't have to give it away to your creditors. Um, so there's all kinds of things that people can do, but it's good for what it is. These uh, statistics, are good for looking at trends, but they're pretty gross. They're not a really very sharp knife, I will admit, okay? Thank you, good question. How's Zoom? Are there questions on Zoom? There are no questions on Zoom, but if you could repeat the questions as they come in. Like oh, thanks for reminding me. Okay, right, I will do that. Okay, shall we go on and talk about the ecosystems? So, um, if you want a model for the ecosystem for a high growth startup company, kind of this thing that we talked about, you need three major resources, types of resources, and also an infrastructure. You've got to have people, you've got to have knowledge, including the idea behind the company, and you have to have capital. So to start a company, the key people involved are the founders and also in this team, you could say, are advisors who typically receive stock or stock options in a company. The knowledge would be where do you get your idea? Do you have access to R&D output? You know, ideation through design thinking is a kind of knowledge creation. Also, access to market and business knowledge is essential. A lot of people make the mistake of thinking that startup companies are all about the technology, but it's really, that's almost in, in the world of physics, the technology may be a nucleus, but if you don't have electrons going around it, meaning a business model, it's not complete. So, um, you know, the, then with capital, what you really, every country, every, every company I've ever seen 
anywhere in the world starts with money from the entrepreneurs and money from their friends and family, right? And then the first external money that typically comes into a company is from an individual investor. On the infrastructure side, yeah, you need physical infrastructure. You also need good legal system. You need good accounting system. And in the infrastructure are the consultants who are paid different from the advisors who are really part of the team, okay? The growth stage is different. The real needs are not founders and advisors and entrepreneurs. It's people who are both willing to work in a startup company and capable of being successful, making the company successful when they work in a startup company. This has been a much bigger issue than most people think about. Everybody wants to teach entrepreneurship, but going to work in a company that's got between 15 and 300 employees is pretty intense experience. The uh, knowledge that you need at this stage are how to scale up, lean startup principles, how to do rapid prototyping, and on the part of the management, suddenly you've got formal boards of directors that represent maybe a majority of the stock in the company, and you have to keep them happy, right? So investor relations becomes important knowledge. This is the stage where you really see VC funds is the growth stage. And later you'll start to get that. The physical infrastructure, not only location, but access to markets and all the soft infrastructure that goes with it. Exit is important too. For an entrepreneurship ecosystem, what happens to the people when they sell their company? A lot of times in Asia, you go out and buy a building, right? You become wealthy and so real estate is the preferred investment. But if you invest in the next generation of startups, you're really contributing back into the ecosystem itself. Um, I think that knowledge at the time of exit, you were talking about mergers and acquisitions. Yeah, this is, this is a really important part of the ecosystem, right? Do you kill the idea by buying it? That used to be the reputation if Samsung bought your company in Korea. That was just the end of your idea. You know, just you, you joined the board, forget it. Um, but, you know, after m &A or IPO, can your company's vision of changing the world somehow continue and the company continue to grow? So, yeah, the financial side of the, is m &A or IPO with the variation with SPACs now. And, you know, you need a business infrastructure at this stage as well. So in Asia, as we've seen, people, you, there are entrepreneurs everywhere. Um, what's happening is people make the choice for how they can be the most successful with what they want to do in life. Um, one reason for the low entrepreneurship rate in Japan is going to work for a big company was a much more secure way of being successful, being socially recognized, uh, and also arguably not having to deal with getting yourself into a position where life is tough for the next 30 years. Um, used to be that way in India. One time I had an Indian VC uh, speak in, in this series, and she said, <laughs> I spend half my time convincing the parents of entrepreneurs that it's really okay. Um, so entrepreneurs are everywhere. People who can be entrepreneurs are everywhere. Asia, really the problem is the growth stage. It's going to work for somebody else's company but they're yet not yet big enough to be really prestigious, to have a brand name that you can tell your parents with pride. Right? So that's one issue. The second issue is incentivization. Until recently, a number of countries in Asia, at least, were pretty cheap in how they were giving out stock options. Okay. Uh, and it's not necessarily just Japan and South Korea. 
I've seen entrepreneurs who were treating their people pretty cheaply in other Asian countries as well. Uh, this, you know, disincentivizes the people to really work as hard as they need to to uh, create the team cohesion for the company to be successful. The new giants, the IT giants, not just Baidu, Alibaba, and Tencent, but Paytem in, in India and some of the others are now starting to drain off the good workers. You've created a new set of prestigious companies. So this, you know, this kind of growth stage is the real issue in Asia, I think. The social stigma is um, there, especially the fear of failure. But I think the perceived lack of opportunities is a bigger problem. And legitimately speaking, if there's no mid-career hiring, you're taking a huge chance if you start a company. Here, find another company in two or three years. The average length of time people stay in one company in Silicon Valley, including San Francisco and so forth, is probably three years or maybe even a little less. Um, but if there's no mid-career opportunities, this is difficult. So the career cost becomes higher, fewer people do it. The other thing that's not been good in Asia is entrepreneurs have too much of a long-term affinity with their companies. They stay in control way too long. So here, the investors kind of keep that from happening. Oh, so-and-so, you founded this wonderful company, but now it has 300 people. We need somebody else to run it. You can become an advisor or you can become the vice president of technology. That happens here all the time. But in Asia, if the entrepreneur keeps too much of the stock, nobody can do that to them. And so I see that lack of clear expectations about exit happening. Uh, here, if you sell your company to somebody, as long as everybody makes money with it, people are gonna call it a success. Um, that is a very clear and simple way of measuring the success, but there's still this lack of clear expectations about exit. Um, there are fewer serial entrepreneurs in Asia now than there used to be, but they are increasing. The, it's getting more sophisticated by the year. I've seen a big change in the last 10 years. Go ahead. I have a question about the approach thing in the US. For example, like Google, Facebook, whatever great companies can not put workers in the US, the talents, you know, but also the prestige of the companies in the US, right? It's more stable, highly. Do you see that happening here as well? So, your question is whether you see a similar pattern in the US with Google and the big companies uh, draining off workers. Yes, except this is such a fluid labor market that most people will go to work for a big company for a few years so they can earn enough money to save up and start their own company when the, when the time is right. So I think that the incredible fluidity of the labor market here keeps that from being as much of a problem as it is in a place where the social stigma of leaving a prestigious company to an unknown startup is higher. We also have this kind of thing here where, oh, you worked at Google, how sad. <laughs> <You know? laughs> when are you gonna do something worthwhile? <laughs> that, no offense to my friends at Google. Uh, but, uh, you know, really, we, we have kind of almost anti-big company mentality here. Uh, so, yeah, great question. Thank you. Okay, so that's the people side. On the knowledge side, there's an amazing amount of science and technology, advanced science and technology that's going on inside universities and national research institutes and also big companies in Asia. Uh, and the Asia countries, the governments have all put a lot of focus on innovation, which is what they really mean is technology transfer from the university into the industry sector. Um, 
All that's great, but there's not enough attention to the flow of business knowledge to new company founders. I see way too many companies in Asia that are founded by a team of engineers, none of whom has business experience. And eventually they will learn, yes, but you could learn a lot faster if, if you did what happens here, where you find somebody from the business sector and make sure that they're on the team. The second problem with knowledge is that mentoring is not really well developed in Asian startups. Part of this is cultural. The legacy of the Confucian apprentice system. Repeat what the master does. Don't ask questions. Just repeat what the master does. And eventually, you'll become the master. And then the next generation has to do what you do. Uh, you do get you know, people changing off and starting new um, schools and dance and flowers and whatever traditional art. But um, those are the entrepreneurs in those areas. And they, it's usually kind of an ugly process, right? So the mentoring of people who are trying to do something new, not well understood. Uh, in a place like Japan, if you talk about the problems you're having with a mentor, you both lose face. It's very hard to find a setting in which you can really have a heart-to-heart -heart talk and analyze some problem, especially something that you didn't do very well. Most of the time, you see this in sports. When a sports team loses in Japan, we didn't try hard enough. That's the explanation almost all the time. Uh, that's one thing. Another thing that kind of keeps mentoring back is less confrontational board management relations. Most of the time, the people on the board in Asian companies, even large Asian companies, were put there by the president and feel loyal to the president more than they do to the shareholders. And so um, you have less confrontation. I think the other area of knowledge is just market access, except maybe in China. B2C is a lot easier in a place like Japan and Korea than B2B is. Because you can come up with something, there's a lot of early adopters in the population in both countries. Uh, and so you may not get systematic feedback. And also, I think that startups in Silicon Valley pivot better. You see something that needs to be changed fundamentally, and it will be changed rather quickly. Um, and there's, you know, the engineer's mistake, which is thinking that your technology is going to sell itself. Right, that never happens. Um, now we get to capital, and this is where I've got a lot of slides. Okay, this is the basic pattern. I've talked about this. What we're seeing is an explosion at the venture capital stage and a kind of continued squeezing out of the early stage funding. I'm hearing reports from people there's a lot of government money to help you start a company. So it's easy to get first money in most places in Asia. Getting the second money before you're ready for venture capital is often the real hardest thing. Um, and the other point is that exit patterns differ incredibly. Uh, in the US, 90% by acquisition. In Japan and South Korea, it's still 85 to 90% of exits are by IPO. And in that IPO, the entrepreneur may have more than 50% of the shares in the company after the company goes public. Unbelievable to somebody in the valley. Um, you also have the investors not quite playing into this high growth model like we have in the valley yet. Investors may expect maximum growth. There's more and more investors who are acting that way, but then they expect early profit sharing. A lot depends on the back background of the venture capitalists who are the general partners in the firm. So worldwide, COVID-19 put an unnatural kind of depression in uh, 2020. This really should have gone up more, but we've gone up an incredible amount in 2021. There was $620 billion 
invested in venture capital in the year 2021. I remember when the entire world amount was less than 100 billion. And in 2015, it was already 171 billion. So you see this huge explosion. It's being divided up in terms of value, where by value, America accounted for about half of the dollars invested in venture capital, right? $311 billion invested in the US in 2021. Um, Asia accounted for about 30% of all of the um, money that was invested. And you can see it goes on down. I'll, I'll share these slides on Canvas and also on our website so you can have your copy. The point here is that by value, America is half of all of the venture capital, but by deal count, Asia is leading America. What? Because the average size of the Asia deal is a lot smaller than it is in the United States. Why is the average deal size smaller? Because we have one deal where $500 million goes to Databricks, right? I mean, we've got just these mega deals that are accounting for almost half of all of the American venture capital that's invested. So we've gone later stage big time. Asia is still, they accounted for 36% of all of the deals done in um, the last quarter of 2021, whereas the US only accounted for 35%. If we look country by country, you see the same kind of thing that you saw worldwide, right? So there wasn't quite as much of a dip in 2020. But in China, you definitely see a dip in 2019 and 2020. I'm uh, not sure exactly what was going on, uh, except that the point now is that 2021 looked great. I'm wondering what 2022 will look like. You know, is this curve going to keep going up or is it going to level off at this point? Um, in any case, money is moving now. What you're seeing in China that is, I think, sad is that angel and seed activity has dropped like a rock over the last seven or eight years, while the late stage VC activity has grown almost by the same kind of curve in, in the opposite direction, right? Um, some of this is mega deal. You know, there are a lot of mega deals in China. Uh, there are a lot of unicorns in China. They have the second largest number of unicorns after the US. Another point about China investing that's worth noting is it's relatively domestically focused. Foreign investors were only part of about 18%, 18.6% of all of the venture capital deals in China in 2021. Now, when you look at that 18% and see who is investing, I'm fascinated to find out that despite all of our stuff about um, you know, decoupling from China and all of that, the American investment community is still very bullish on China, right? You don't see that much of a drop between 2018 and 2021. Um, yeah, so America is still a very important investor. American investors are very important players in Chinese venture capital. If you look at by sector, so this is the way it was defined. Software, IT, hardware, software was the biggest. And um, you're seeing all of this on the right-hand side gives you specific numbers to show how, for instance, early stage deals, uh, early stage VC deals has not changed so much. It's the angel deals that, um, you know, have dropped from 25% of all the deals to 10% of all the deals in 2021. But software, IT hardware, commercial goods and services, and consumer goods and services are the big four. Those are the four biggest sectors for venture capital in China. 
In comparison, India, this is harder to see. I couldn't get a graph that matched exactly what the China graph looked like. But basically, India has the same kind of pattern that everybody else did. In 2020, you had a noticeable drop. And in 2021, this is only half the first half of the year, you're seeing things really coming back. So India has really moved. I've got some new, uh, new data I may update this slide. Um, but unlike China, India is incredibly, I, hate, I don't want to say dominated, but foreign investment makes up, foreign investors are participants in the vast majority of deals in India. Uh, this is not to say that there's no domestic venture capital there. It has grown. It's a lot. But um, American investors, partly because of reputation of China, maybe, have been in over 100 deals just in the second quarter of 2021, whereas the Chinese investors have kind of dropped. Uh, they were only involved in 10 deals in the uh, second quarter of 2021, partly because they're country has put in something similar to the CFIUS regulations in the US. It's very hard for a Chinese person to invest in India now. So um, this is the way that trend is going, but India is like 80% of the deals have some sort of a foreign investor involved. In Southeast Asia, which is the third largest sector after China and India, what you have is a reduction in funding because there were fewer mega rounds. They were really exceptional earlier because of giant investments in Gojek or in Grab. Uh, and, you know, yet fewer than 10% of the rounds were Series C or later. There were some big rounds. Ninja Van made a lot of money and Advanced Intelligence Group made a lot of money. Um, but uh, I think the important things to remember about um, Southeast Asia is the biggest market is Indonesia. They are getting the most, well, about half of all the money goes into Indonesia. And Singapore is playing the role of financial center. A lot of the money that goes eventually into Indonesia goes through Singapore. Um, and Singapore startups took 32%. I also found out in researching this that the Singapore government is making a really sweet deal if you want to start a technology startup there. For up to Singapore $250,000, they will put in 70% of the money to start your company. And then from $250,000 to $2 million Singapore dollars, they will match every dollar you raise from private sources with government money. That uh, makes fundraising a lot easier. <laughs> so that kind of support is, is definitely going to continue having an impact, I think. Um, in South Korea, with what, 50 million people? Whereas um, Southeast Asia has 650 or maybe 700 million people and about $10 billion of venture capital. So South Korea had about 6.8 billion in uh, the year 2021. Um, the number of VC funds came to exceed 1,000 in 2020. So most of the venture capital firms in South Korea are relatively small. They've got 400 or 500 million dollars under uh, of assets under management. Um, there are several. There are a number that are billion dollar funds, and one of the things about these billion dollar funds is that they're starting to target Southeast Asia. I found some very interesting news about the joint funds that six or seven of the of the more prominent Korean investments have along with Southeast Asia venture capital partners. Um, investment seems to be growing across all sectors, but especially medical and other services. Remember, this was a COVID year. Uh, ICT, gaming and entertainment, and also blockchain are hot in uh, South Korea. In Japan, first of all, I had trouble getting good data out of Japan. 
Uh, apologies for a, a slide that's in Japanese, but one of the interesting things, this is from the Japan, Japan Venture Capital Association, the Association of Venture Capital Firms. So rather than saying that it fits what CB Insights or Crunchbase or PitchBook or some of the other sources that you use for investment here, this really may be more about their members and maybe missing a lot of money. But um, the interesting thing is that the venture capital firms in Japan were investing almost half as much money outside Japan as they were inside Japan. So the total amount invested in 2020, according to this source, their uh, yearly research, uh, was about $1.9 billion US. Now, according to a second source, a separate source in 2021, it was 5.1 billion, which is a huge jump from 2 billion. And that source only said it was up 50%. So they must be counting things in a different way than people are counting here. Um, the sources where people are spending their money, IT and related is the majority. Japan is in the middle of a digital transformation boom. And this is the most popular word you will hear from companies talking about new things. Biomed healthcare. Partly remember it was a COVID year. Industrials and energy, this is uh, driven not only by government policy, but by a really high interest in the public for more green solutions and then other products and services. So uh, a couple of things just in general. In Japan, unlike most places, the majority of venture capital deals involve what we call corporate venture capital. This is not financial institutions that only care about financial return. These are corporations that want some sort of strategic return as well. They want to learn something from the investment or have an inside track to use the technology that the company is developing. In China, uh, there is corporate venture capital, but it's dominated by a very small number of, of the giant firms. So that's something to kind of pay attention to is who's doing the investing. If you do counting unicorns, I don't really like this chart. I may change it uh, because I'm, my understanding is that there's now over 600 something unicorns and this is a little bit old. This was from about a year and a half ago. But notice the US is way in the lead because we have these things like giant funds and mega deals and SPACs to kind of keep things from going public too early. Um, so unicorns means that your IPO is later and usually larger, but a unicorn status can also lead to less transparency and uh, require, require early stage investors who can't keep buying in in later stages to sell their shares at the, to the mega funds at a lower valuation than if they could stay all the way to exit. Um, typical venture capital fund is last for 10 years and you can usually get a two year extension. Uh, but what do you do with the stock that you have at the, end of the, at the end of the term of the venture capital fund? You must dispose of it in some way and return the money to your investors. So, more unicorns means you're going to have stocks you've got to unload. There's a higher probability you're going to have to unload some of your portfolio before you're ready to, uh, if you're thinking as an investor. Uh, last substantive slide, the difference about exits. You see how it looks in the U.S., right? In 2020, there were 606 acquisition exits and 120 uh, M&A exits. Whereas in Asia in 2020, it's almost half and half. And uh, out of this, you do see the difference here. You see, this is good for your question, right? This shows the difference between strategic acquisition, buyout and IPO, right? So the buyouts are a relatively small percentage. Um, but that kind of difference shows the that the real differences in entrepreneurship is not about starting a company, it's about how you grow the company and what you do with it when it's time to exit. So in summary for today, the uh, 
funding has bounced back like crazy ever since whatever happened in 2019, 2020. And despite the uncertainty in the world that we started out talking about, the uh, entrepreneurial ecosystems are doing just fine. They're looking at problems and finding new solutions, seeing opportunities. Um, you know, depending on what happens in Ukraine, uh, if things really go south and we all wind up in World War III, that would probably have a very bad impact on the entrepreneurial ecosystem. But uh, otherwise, I'm amazed that all the trouble we're having in society, the entrepreneurship world is just full steam ahead again. So with people in knowledge flow, we talked a little bit about that. Opportunity-driven entrepreneurs are really the norm in Asian economies. Mentoring is a problem. And then we spent a, quite a few slides looking at the growth of the venture capital industry across major uh, economies. The focus is on growth and later stage. Early stage investing has always been difficult but it's even harder now because people with a lot of money are thinking the alternatives to make money a little bit less risky and a little bit earlier return, later stage. The kind of investing is clearly driven by demand sectors. I'm excited because I see some movement toward cross-border activities, the Koreans investing in Southeast Asia, uh, that kind of thing. I'm also seeing more deep tech in places you would be surprised at. So in three weeks, we've got a panel from India, a venture capital investor who's also past president of the Stanford Alumni Association in India. And she's introduced two entrepreneurs to us. Uh, one is a unicorn founder in EdTech. And the other person has a company doing satellite-based hyperspectral imaging. This is pretty high-tech stuff. So, you know, this is coming from India. Um, and you're seeing variation in the exit patterns depending on uh, the country, longer-term incubation versus what I would call Silicon Valley style. There's a lot of Silicon Valley style and it's growing. And I would say neither style is better than the other. They each have tendencies toward waste. You just have to know what's good and what are the, what are the good points and what are the weaknesses of each model and make sure that you have the right kind of expectations for where you are. So I'm really excited. Next week, uh, my good colleague, Dr. Chen Yang Xu, who I've worked with on open innovation for a long time, is going to uh, talk to us about his new company that he just founded. And I'm not sure if it's Guangzhou or Shenzhen, um, called PVMed, which is doing artificial intelligence enhanced uh, medical diagnosis of uh, medical images. And then two weeks from now, we have a uh, capitalist coming in from Malaysia. Three weeks from now, we have uh, our panel from India. I'm planning a session on Japan. I've got an invitation out to uh, South Korea. I've got somebody confirmed for later in the quarter who's coming in from Thailand. So I think we've got a great quarter ahead. Really look forward to working with you on it. Questions? Um, I have a question about like the future landscape of like buyers because um because especially I noticed like recent, for example, China has regulations and they cancel, for example, they have finance, they cancel all of the investment division for like and the strategic of strategic buyers. Yeah. So will that like influence like future like exit options? Because now um, for example, in China corporate like CBCs, they have a like, limited access or limited ability to invest certain companies. Um, I think that's kind of like... So I'm not familiar with, okay, your question is about uh, China regulations and its impact on corporate venture capital. Yeah, yeah. I'm not aware of a law against corporate venture capital, but what I am aware of is very intense government scrutiny about what they would call speculation. 
And I think that um, certainly the government in China is trying to reduce the power of the private business sector. Uh, it's been an engine of growth for the economy. And the people who are successful entrepreneurs in Japan know how to manage this, right? Uh, but I think that this is something where we don't see what direction it's going. Uh, I do think that in an economy like, I mean, without the kind of fast paced background that you have in China, um, open innovation where you do corporate venture capital in companies of interest so that you can set your own strategic direction better is more important when you have an established industrial base with lots of competitors. When you're growing as fast as you can, getting there first is the big thing. And so open innovation may actually be slower than doing it in-house, but I'm not sure what will happen. There is a question on uh, chat, yes, sir. I don't have chat open. Yes, okay, so the, um, Question from Siddharth. Mm -hmm. The future will require greater global efforts to decarbonize global energy food and industry. Given the talk of decoupling and deglobalization, while at the same time research is so open and based on global cooperation, will decarbonization technology development in the future be driven by globalist cooperation or nationalistic competition? I hope it's, glo it's uh, globalist cooperation. <laughs> I mean, uh, I think that the tendencies against globalization are there. These systems, problems like that, have a tendency to self-correct, but on the way to self-correction, you may waste a lot of money and lose a lot of competitive advantage. Uh, I would think that climate change is one of those issues where it should be easier to cooperate than a lot of other issues just like biomed should be easier to cooperate that with across countries than it is with other issues. But um, yeah, it's hard. I think that um, you need a good framework. The framework does need to be um, rules-based, but California is the most heavily regulated economy inside the United States, and yet we're a hotbed of innovation because people know how to deal with it. So on a global scale, I'm hoping that we will have global cooperation. The more heads you get together from different, you know, diverse viewpoints, the better solutions you'll come up with. And innovation requires large markets to support it. It doesn't make sense to draw a border at the end of the, you know, the nation state and say that this innovation cannot benefit anybody beyond the border. Um, but that's, you know, I'm, I'm expressing my kind of values rather than my analysis. On analysis, I really don't know. Uh, I'm hoping that the anti-globalist sentiment will not take over. Thanks, that's a, that's a great question. Other questions? Hey. Uh, I wanted to make a comment on valuations and unicorns and stuff like that. Yeah. Like a huge reason why you're seeing like top brand VC firms such as A16Z, Sequoia, and Pantera, like doing later stage VC investments into these startups with astronomical valuations is because that's also to dilute the contributions of future investors so that those top brand firms who still have significant voting power over future investors as well. Okay, that's a, a great comment that if you invest at an incredibly high valuation, any future investor is going to have a much smaller piece of the pie. Okay. So this gives the, the gorilla VC firms like A16Z or whoever the uh, opportunity to control more of the destiny of the companies and Keep warm. Yeah, welcome to the real world. <laughs> Agreed. Go ahead. So I think you alluded to this um, earlier in the discussion, but so it seems like there's like this trend in the US where companies are staying fired a bit longer. Um, and I was, and I mean, even like now, it seems it's the point where a lot of public market investors are backing 
startups and you know private companies and like really big rounds and stuff like that. Yeah. Do you think this is like a trend over time or is it unique to the US? Do you think this will happen in the Asian markets as well over time? It's already happened in the Asian markets. Remember, SoftBank Vision Fund was one of the first big ones. And technically, that's a Japan based fund, although it's almost never included with the statistics on Japan. Um, and so, yeah, this is, this is a tendency. A few years ago, we had one of the partners from GGV, which is a big VC that does a lot of international investing. And I asked her uh, what she thought about, um, you know, SoftBank vision and this tendency toward, you know, everything mega deal and all of that. And she said, oh, we kind of look at them like an exit. Okay, if we can sell our stock at a great multiple and move on and put it somewhere and put the money somewhere else, we're happy. So um, I think that that's kind of turning over the ownership of the company in a way that didn't really happen in the classic model. People would keep their stock until exit in the classic model, right? And now if you're selling it off to the giant PE firms or the SoftBank vision firms, that kind of thing, it's a rather different set of dynamics about the growth of the company. And to some extent, this has, tends to have anti-ESG implications, right? Environment, social inclusiveness, and good governance. I'm kind of a little bit concerned that when money is the only thing that matters, that's not a good system. <laughs> so yeah, great comment though. Yeah, other, uh, in, okay. Um, I'd love to hear thoughts about multinational companies like Zoom that have both US and Chinese tools. How do you think these kinds of companies will change our globalist structures, adapt uh, post COVID? Come back next week. Our speaker, Dr. Xu, is locating his company both here and in either Shenzhen or Guangzhou. And he is doing exactly that. Um, and I think that um, something like Zoom, where you've got a service that's all about connecting people, absolutely that makes sense to be a global company, right? Um, and in fact, I've been sort of amazed that for the longest kind of time, companies that really should be global companies have been held at arm's length in China. Facebook, Twitter are not available there, right? Gmail is iffy. Um, that kind of thing has been allowing domestic competitors to get stronger in China. Uh, it hasn't really hurt anything yet because of the speed that this technology and business change is going on. But I wonder if it's eventually going to lead to the weaknesses of protectionism on both sides, where uh, if you are too, if you have too good a situation in one market, you tend to get sloppy and, and a little bit. Competing against people is very good for keeping companies on their edge, right? So um, I, I think coming back next week is a, a really good, the best way to talk about that. It's an area that I'm concerned about because we have so many good potential for uh, cooperation between the two countries in a difficult situation, which is something that requires legitimate consideration. We need to keep the good things going. So yeah, I think we're out of time. Thank you very much much for your attention. I'll stay around for a few minutes. If anybody else wants to talk on Zoom or here, we'll open it up. But for now, I'll turn off the recording and say class one is over. Thanks, everybody.